appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. We're, we never close anything out, do we? Uh, but we're closing out this letter of 2 Thessalonians this morning. This will be our final message at this point in time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 through 18 this morning. Men, Lord willing, we're going to start the book of 1 Timothy when I get back. So if you want to start your homework assignment, we're just going to keep right on going. All we have to do is turn the page. So Paul has written to this church, and there have been some issues in the church. And sometimes issues are doctrinal, sometimes issues are conduct, uh, sometimes they're both. Uh, sometimes it's complicated, you know, sometimes it's pretty simple. But that's the one of the reasons and the purpose in us having these letters. We have we have similar issues to deal with in our own church and in our own lives, as the apostles did and the disciples did when Jesus was on the earth. So their problems became learning opportunities for us. And so it is here. We have a person who does not want to work. And again, this is a, this is a, a will not, not a cannot. There are plenty of people that cannot work. They've got a, you know, something going on. So this is not coming. Paul's not dealing with that. He deals with that in other places in the in the New Testament. But here, this person is quite capable of working, but they will not work. And he had made that clear over there in verse 10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. So those are the folks that Paul has been after here. As, uh, we close out the text of dealing with that, and we close out the book and the salutation of Paul here in verse 17 um, I'll just start reading in verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and they eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And now the Lord, the Lord of peace himself, give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is this token in every epistle, and so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So uh, that's going to close out this book here this morning. But as we see in this letter and in this church, they had to deal with, uh, with some issues. So, you know, it's important for churches to have discern discernment, and it's important for churches to have discipline. You know, the Bible in the New Testament, Paul uses the, he uses the athlete uh, as an example. You know, and we all see athletes, and they're usually in pretty good shape, and they usually eat a pretty good diet. So if you want to be in good shape, you're going to exercise a lot, and you're going to eat well. You know, that's just a part of, of being an athlete. It just goes with the territory. And so it does with the church. A church has to have discernment, and a church has to have discipline. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And, you know, this is a, this is a good for them to have a discernment. This is good, you know, for them uh, to, to deal with these things. So, you know, the, the discipline of an athlete is very visible, isn't it? The, the diet choices they make are very visible um, for us to see, and it's a part of being an athlete. It's a part of being a good church is for the church to have discernment. 
You know, and we're, we're living in an age where it's just about anything goes, right? And we have people that aren't even saved trying to run churches or get in churches or do this or do that. People that, that don't even know the gospel, understand the gospel or know the Lord, and maybe they think they do. But uh, there's just no discernment. And Paul dealt with that over in 2 Corinthians. Remember when we went through there, you know, and it's an important for us to have this discernment. As individuals, it's important for us to have this discernment as a church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, remember Paul said that the athlete, they do this for a corruptible crown. You know, so they're doing these things uh, to be a good athlete for a corruptible crown. But Paul says we do it for an incorruptible crown. So there's much more at stake here for the church than there is for an athlete. You know, so Paul said, so run that you may obtain an incorruptible crown. So a church must have discernment and a church must have discipline. Paul's made that clear here uh, in this church uh, at, at uh, Thessalonica. So where, and where do these things come from? Well, these things come from the word of God. You know, we want to do what God says to do. You know, that's so important. And, and Paul lays this out here because, you know, we are not in charge of circumstances. We're not in charge of the things that come our way in the church. We're not in charge, you know, of these things. So we're responsible to respond in the proper way. So, you know, the church here uh, in Thessalonica is doing that. So, you know, the Word of God is where we learn how to deal with these things. We learn, you know, God shows us, you know, what's right and wrong. God shows us, you know, what is sin and what is not sin. And all these things come from the Word of God. And as the Bible says over in Ephesians chapter 4, there where, you know, the it talks about the gifts in the church and the, the function of the church and the and those things going on and up there in, you know, in, in the first part of chapter uh, 4, verse 11, it, Paul says God gave us pastors for the work of the ministry. And then the next verse says for the perfecting of the saints. So that's what the Word of God does. It, it perfects the saints. It shows us what is right and what is wrong. It shows us what to think and what to know and how to act and conduct ourselves in, in every manner. And this particular manner is here, is, is in the church. You know, so that's that takes precedence, doesn't it? There that, you know, perfecting us by the, and with the knowledge of the Son of God. So as we get in the Word and we study the Word of God and we are exposed to the Son of God, then He helps us in our conduct and in our behavior and how to treat one another, what's right and what is wrong, and what should uh, be done. And athletes, are they're doing it, you know, the Olympics come around, what, every four years. So they're doing it, you know, for a corruptible crown and an opportunity that comes around every four years. But, you know, those things are serious. And, you know, and so is sin, you know, and so is God. God is serious. Sin is serious. The Word of God is serious. So, you know, that's why we need some discernment. That's why we need some discipline. You know, and so many people think we don't need that in the church. We don't need that in our lives. We just accept everything and everybody. And that's not true. And here Paul is very clear what needs to be done. He's talking about these busybodies. Last week we looked at them up there in verse 11. They work not at all, but they're busybodies. So they're they don't have time to work, but they have time to be to be uh, meddling in everybody's life. And Paul says, these are the ones that uh, we want you to talk to. And, you know, discipline and discernment, it always has a purpose, right? You know, we want to do what's right. We want to do what the Word of God says to do. We want to do what God has asked us to do. So, that's the reason that we want to have a knowledge of the Son of God. We want to have a knowledge of the Word of God is so that we might be be busy doing this well-doing that he talked about up there in verse 13, you know, and, and, and not 
and not shun people, you know, like the Amish do. You know, they, they use these verses like this to mistreat people. And we're never, the church is never to mistreat anyone, regardless of what has been done or is being done. That we have no right to do that. You know, and, and Paul says here and shows us what to do and how to do it. Um, and he says that in verse 15, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So that even encompasses our attitude toward these things. So what we want is is for the you know the person to be corrected or the situation in the church to be corrected and everybody recover from it. You know, and nobody leaves, but everybody is a part of the church going forward. That's what God wants. You know, that's God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our, our thoughts. Our thoughts go this way. God's thoughts go that way. So we want to do things God's way. And over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, there where Paul talks about the inspiration of the Scriptures, he says that the the Word of God is, is profitable. It is profitable. And, you know, he's saying a similar thing here, that do things God's way uh, for them is profitable. It's the right thing to do. That's why he said, be not weary in well-doing. You guys, I want you guys to do the right thing, not sweep this in, under the carpet, not, you know, uh, act like nothing has going on which they had already done that in the first letter. And this is the third time now that, that Paul mentions this. But, you know, the Word of God, doing what God, doing God's will is always profitable. You know, that's what Paul says about the Word of God. So if we know what God's will is, we know what God's purposes are, and that's the well-doing, then, you know, we should be doing the right thing uh, for God. That's the will of God for us. And that's uh, what happens when we obey the Scripture. You know, we, um, we're doing what is profitable. We're doing what is right. That's that well-doing up there in verse 13 again. So, and, and again, Paul said that this is what? This is not Paul's opinion. He says over in verse 12, it's the commandment of Jesus Christ. That's what this is. So, that's what the Word of God is. It's a commandment of God. You think the Olympics are important? You think, you know, uh, discipline and eating right and all those things for athletes, that's all important. But it's even more important for the church to be doing things by the commandments of the Lord and have a right attitude about those commandments. And that's what Paul says here in verse 12. So it's it's profitable. So the Word of God is profitable for us as individuals. It's profitable for us collectively, you know. So we want to do the right thing, and that's what Paul's calling them to do, the whole group, you know, to, together uh, to deal with this. And then he says there in verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, any man. And again, he doesn't name names here. He lets this person be anonymous, but he points out, they obey not the word. So it's pretty simple. Um, they're not obeying this commandment that God has given, that if a man would not work, neither shall he eat. Over there in verse 10. So it's the duty of the church. It's our duty as a church to find uh, this person who is obeying not the word of this epistle, and Paul says, Note that man, have no company company with him, that he might be ashamed. So, you know, that's, you know, this is the only time, I mean, the Bible calls for unity in the body of Christ, it, and, and it does call out sin, and it calls out sin here. And, you know, Paul, this is the only time that we're told to, to do these kinds of things is when we have people that obey not God. And that's what's going on. They're, they're not obeying God. And, you know, Paul says, here's what we should do then. Have no company with him that he might be ashamed. So there's two groups here. There's the group that obeys not, and there's the group that is obeying. So we see this little um, 
departure here between the two people, between the two groups. You know, the have-nots, and but here it's the obeys and the obey-nots. That's who, who Paul is pointing out. And again, he doesn't name names. He lets these people uh, rena- remain anonymous, but he's anticipating they may not obey. So he didn't say, well, they're going to obey and, you know, let's just move on. He says they may not obey. And you go to them for the third time. You know, those are the three things Jesus said to do in Matthew 18. You know, this is how we deal with those who obey not. We go to them by ourselves. We go to them with two or three. And then, you know, we have to tell the whole church. Those are the things that Jesus laid out for us. And here Paul's down to this is the third strike for these people. Third time Paul's brought this up. And whether or not it was ignored by the people or they they dealt with it, we don't know all those details. We just have Paul saying, if they don't obey this, they don't obey the commandment of the Lord, he says, note that man and have no company with him. Those who are not obeying the commandment of the Lord. That's the ones that Paul is talking about here. They're not obeying the authority of the Lord. And that's what the scripture is. That's what the commandments are. You know, they're the uh, they're the, the commandments of the Lord. And Paul says, if they obey not the commandments of the Lord, that's where they're coming from. Then note that man. So again, this is the third strike. And, and he says two things here. In our verse, he says, note that man and have no company with him. So what does this mean, note? Well, that's it's in the continu- continual tense. So Paul says, make note of him, whether, you know, I'm sure they didn't take <clears throat> minutes back then, but if we had church minutes, maybe we would make note of it in the church minutes, or maybe they would make note of it with the elders who this person is and that they had talked to them about this situation. So, you know, that's that's what Paul wants. He wants it noted, you know, privately by the church to make note of this and who this person is, you know. And, 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 he's, and again, remember, he says this is well-doing up there in verse 13. So they're still, this is still well-doing, you know, doing what Paul says here. To do, and this company here is you know it's fellowship. Um, have no company. That's the opposite of fellowship. Have no fellowship with him that he might be ashamed. So, you know the aim the aim of the discipline, the aim of this, doing this is to call out what it's to call out their laziness over there in verse twelve. You know if he won't work, neither. Should he eat? So that's the aim of the church is to get this person working. You know, that's the goal. And, you know, not to not to shun him, not to mistreat him, not to make him feel, you know, this or that. I mean, he does say here that they might be ashamed, that they might be ashamed that they're not working. There in verse 14. You know, this uh, goes along with what Paul told the Romans uh, turn over to Romans chapter 15, verse 1. That's nearby. Toward the end of the book. Chapter 15, verse 1. And Paul told the Galatians a similar thing too. It's... You know, if there's a situation, just, you know, we need to try to get the the most mature people to deal with it. You know, that's what we need. And it's one of the reasons that we, God has given us a pastor. We need mature people to deal with these things, you know. And we need to do what Paul told the Galatians. We need to consider ourselves lest we be tempted. So we we shouldn't look at a situation and say, well, I'd never do that or that. You know, that's not going to happen on my watch, or there's a new sheriff in town, you know, or get any any kind of attitude like that. 
No, he says, we that are strong. So if we say we're spiritually strong, we ought to be able to handle difficult situations. We ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. We're not in it for ourselves, but them. And let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. That's the goal. You know, whether, you know, it's, it's a job situation and they're being lazy or any kind of situation, um, you know, the, our goal should not be to shun them and make them feel bad and guilty and send them off. Um, no, we, we want to recover them. That's what Paul wants with these, with these lazy people here in the Thessalonian church. He wants them recovered. And then he says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. So, verse 7, Wherefore receive you one another as Christ received us to the glory of God. Of God, so we ought to be pretty uh, not not selfish, but selfless in these situations, and let be help to others. So turn back to our verse, and that's what Paul told the Galatians: "You who are spiritual, restore such ones." So if you, you know, if we're spiritual and use spiritual people to deal with these situations like this, and again. Paul said, this is the commandment of the Lord. This isn't, you're not disobeying the United States. You're not disobeying, you're disobeying the Lord here. You know, so here's what we do. Just in case these people don't listen, we note that man, we have no company with that man. And it's, that's what the Word of God does. It, it speaks with authority. And, you know, Paul points that out here. Um, in these verses. So, also important. And now, in verse 15, he says, Yet, he says, Yet count not him as an enemy, but abonish him as a brother. So, you know, Paul doesn't want us to misunderstand verse 14 and say, Well, this guy made a mistake. Here's my chance. I'll get even with him. I mean, that's not the way it's to be done. It's, it's quite the opposite. We're after a brother, not after our enemy. Paul makes that clear. So he says, don't misunderstand, you know, what I've said here in, in treating this person, piling on on this person. You know, it, everybody has a conscience, you know, and, and you know, every situation uh, should be approached with the utmost prayer and the utmost kindness and mercy and grace that we can we can muster up and treat them as a brother here, as Paul puts it. So, you know, it's 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 what Paul's asked us to do. And, you know, some people refuse the counsel of God. I mean, even Christians. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. You know, and we have to be ready for that. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, Paul, he wants them to see that as well. If that's their attitude, Paul says, have no company with him that he may be ashamed. But other people are saying, oh, wow, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Word of God says. They have a different attitude. They have a different approach. So, you know, and, you know, it, it's good to do the three strike thing. Maybe, you know, maybe we don't understand something. You know, that happens all the time. We, Something happens and we don't understand. We don't have all the details. We don't have, you know, somebody explain to us what happens. So it's good to do the three-step thing, you know, help understand what's what's going on here, um, and and treat him as a brother. You know, and, and uh, maybe it's not as bad as we think. I mean, this is definitely as bad as they thought because this person's not working. Paul had asked him to deal with it. And they're not dealing with it. So it's to this point here with him where he says, admonish him as a brother. And if the word admonish, um, and it should be, you know, two people in the church at this point to, to admonish him as a brother, to tell him what he's done wrong. And that the word admonish means to, to put in mind. It means remembrance. It's what we do at the Lord's Supper. We we remember the Lord's death until He come. We 
He, we put it in our minds what he has done for us, and that's what the word admonish means. It means to put in mind. So the two, the two brothers go to this brother, and they, they put him in mind of these things. What things? The Lord's commandment. And if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. So put that in his mind, you know, and, and, um, and let him know that their behavior is creating a problem in the church. You know, some people can't see that, but it's obviously going on here. And, you know, Paul wants it rectified. Paul wants it turned around, you know, before more people join in on this approach to Christianity that we don't have to work. So, you know, the admonishing is warning somebody. And that, that's what Paul wants them to do, warn this brother that they're causing a disruption in the church by being lazy um, and not working over there in verse 10, being busy, busy bodies in verse 11. You know, and, we, and again, Paul wants everything done for this person. You know, roll out the red carpet for them. Our goal is to get them restored. Our goal is to get them to repent. Our goal is to get them to get a job you know, and, and obey the Lord. That was what Paul wanted for them, you know, because he says down in verse 18, he says, you know, grace be with you all, everyone. These, these brothers that are lazy, this situation that's going on, he's, he's still a brother. And, you know, we, that's what we do when we talk to people. We share the gospel with them. If we have to tell somebody that about hell, then we have to say, hey, yeah, there is a hell. And, Warned them. We're we're admonishing them that you know you want to avoid hell. You need to come to faith in Christ. You need to be born again. So we're admonishing them. We're warning them about God's promises. And here, it's not about hell. It's about not being a worker, not having a job, as he points it out up there in verse um, uh, ten. Turn over to Second Timothy chapter two. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 19. And Paul dealt with the situation up there in verse 18, these false teachers, and, you know, and once, you know, we understand what God's Word says, once we understand what the commandment is, once we understand what... God's will is, once we understand uh, the direction that we should go in, then, then, you know, we should go. And that's what verse 19 says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, that's Paul's instruction. That's God's instruction to us when we discover a sin in ourselves or in the church, uh, like he has pointed out back here, turn back to our verse. So that's what this person needs to be told. They need to be admonished as a brother and say, you know, you need to depart from iniquity. You name the name of Christ, please depart from iniquity. And, um, you know, re remember in John chapter 21, remember that, that chapter is on, there's a lot there, but the primary thing is Jesus gets Peter reconciled back to himself there, doesn't he? You know, Peter denied the Lord, and he went clear through the he went clear through the crucifixion. He went clear through uh, those three days and the empty tomb, knowing that he denied the Lord. You know, and Peter's actions caused a public scandal. Her people said, oh, you, aren't you one of his followers? Oh, no, not me. Peter's actions caused a public scandal around Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He said, Peter, you lost your salvation. You got to be born again. <laughs> it's not what Jesus said. He said, children. He didn't say enemies. He said, children. That's who we are. We're children of God, and you cannot undo that. 
You and I can physically, if I've, you've been born again, I've been born again, I am not promoting antinomianism to go out and do whatever you want, but you know what the Bible says. We have that blessed assurance. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. If any man be in Christ, as, as Romans chapter 8, that whole chapter talks about, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. So they don't need to be born again. They're children of God. They need reconciled, and that's what Jesus did. He said, children, have you any food? And he went after them. He went after Peter. And by the time the chapter's over, what did, what did Peter, Jesus say to Peter? Peter, do you love me? He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. So we should approach every Christian the same way. And no one's, you know, Peter caused a public scandal. And Jesus said, children, have you any food? So we're still children of God. We're not enemies of God because something's happened, whether we've done it or somebody else has done it. So sins are sins, are sins, but they need to be dealt with in a way that Jesus dealt with them. And it's to get people reconciled to God. It's to get people reconciled to Christ. It's for God to get his children back. It's to leave the 99 and go after the one. And that's what Jesus did. And that should be our goal. Our goal should be seeing these people, you know, reconciled back to God, to the Lord of the church. And, you know, what did Peter do? He, he obeyed the Lord. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. And, and he did it. So that's what we need. We need people to obey the Lord. And, um, you know, Jesus... There was no one ever as concerned about sin as Christ. But there's no one ever loved sinners like Christ. So we need to have the, we need to have a similar approach is see sin for what it is, but see people for what they are as well and want them admonished, want them reconciled as a brother back to the Lord of peace here that Paul's talking about in verse 16. You know, Paul should have lost his patience by now. You know, I, I, this is, you know, I went through both of the Corinthian letters, and not one time did Paul lose his temper with the Corinthians and, and just, you know, wad everything up and leave them, you know, and say, you're on your own. That wasn't Paul. He stayed there. He worked with them. You know, many hours, and, and, and to get them to understand the truth. You know, and that's Jesus. He wants us to understand the truth. He wants us to know the truth, and that he's the Lord of peace, as he says there in verse 16. And, you know, we don't, we don't want people swallowed up with sorrow, you know, and that's what happens to the Amish that get shunned. You know, they're out there on their own, and, they're just swallowed up with sorrow because they have no one. They're being shunned. They're being, you know, derived and, and, and all those kinds of things. And, you know, that's the church never punishes. That's not, we're here to minister. We're not here to punish anyone for anything. And that's what Paul is trying, the point he's trying to get across here in verse 15. They're our brother. You know, put yourself in their shoes. Maybe it'll be you next time instead of them. So we need to be kind. We need to be uh, like Paul is here. And now Paul cries out in verse 16 for prayer for all of this, you know. Um, now the, the Lord of peace give peace always by all means, and the Lord be with you all. So Paul, he calls on the Son of God here to help in this situation. You know, and... Jesus is the author of peace, isn't he? And, you know, he said, my peace I'll give unto you. And, and Romans 5, 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Jesus is the author and finisher of peace. It comes from him. And there is no peace that lasts. His peace is eternal. That's the one that we want. 
We don't want any kind of temporary peace. We don't want any peace that comes and goes. We want this eternal peace that he himself gives. That's what Paul, he says here, and the, the way this is worded in the Greek, that he himself, the Lord himself, gives us peace. He's the author of it. He's the finisher of it. And Paul says, uh, every one of you, he leaves no one out. You know, he wants this fellow reconciled. He wants these people reconciled. And that's what, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 11, didn't he? He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that rest only he can give. That peace only he can give. So he's the one that we point uh, people to. And the Bible says when a, when a man's ways please the Lord, he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. God's over everything and everybody. And he hands out this peace that only comes from the Lord. And what's that song? Peace like a river. Uh, what's that song? Peace like a river. You know, it's uh, that's who Jesus is. He's the peacemaker. He's made peace with God for us sinners. And, and he reigns in peace. Yeah, can you imagine Jesus getting his peace interrupted in heaven? That's not going to happen. It gets interrupted down here, but it's not going to get interrupted up there. And this Lord of peace, someday he's going to come back uh, for us and take us home. So, you know, he's... Um, Jesus is on the right side of peace. If you want to, you want to be a winner, you want to, you want to side with Him. Um, he's already won the victory, and and we through Him, through this new birth, through the gospel, through the salvation, He became a friend of sinners. He He died for our sins. He not only shows us what sin is and points it out, helps us to understand it. He literally paid the price for sin. He hands out peace to us sinners, to us troubled people. He is the one. He's the Lord of peace, as Paul puts it here. So, you know, and, and because of that, we don't have to cover up sin. We don't have to pretend like it doesn't exist. We don't have to pretend like, you know, it, it, it's not to be dealt with. We can deal with it. We can deal with it the way God says to deal with it and know that Christ has paid the penalty for our sins, and not only ours, but our brothers and sisters in Christ. These sins have been paid for. And this is written in the Greek like this. May the Lord of peace, from whom all peace flows, himself give you peace. It's just like boom, boom, boom. That's who this is giving us this peace. Um, turn to Psalm 46. Some of you have heard of John Wesley. I've read the story about John Wesley. Turn to Psalm 46. That he was in London, and there was an earthquake in London. It was kind of like their 9-11. Nine, their the buildings were falling in. Building after building was falling in. People were running around, crying all about, after building after building after building was falling onto the ground. And John Wesley, he got his group, he got his church together, and he read to them Psalm 46. And here in Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, a holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall keep her, and that right early. The nations raged, the kingdoms moved, 
He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Uh, what desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear asunder. He burns the chariot in the fire. And be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. You know, there's one thing God wants us to do is, is to get rid of all our hope in anything on this earth. There's nothing on this earth we can trust in, including ourselves. The only thing we can trust in is God. And what, you know, we can put all our trust in Him, as that psalm clearly indicates. So turn back to our verse. That's the psalm that John Wesley read to his congregation during the earthquake in London. That's a good one, isn't it? So God is our refuge, no matter what. And all our hope is in Him. He's the God of peace, the Lord of peace. And then Paul says in verse 17, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, and so I write. You know, this, this is the way Paul typically ended his letters. You know, and, and there may be a, a handwriting change here. Maybe, you know, Timothy was writing or somebody else was writing and then, you know, we got to the end and then Paul takes the pen to write. And if you if you were, if they notice a, a difference in the handwriting, Paul's telling them why here. Um, but this letter carries with it um, the inspiration and the infallibility that it deserves. And, you know, he, he writes that. So, I don't know what Paul's autograph looked like, but he puts his autograph at the end of this letter. You know, a lot of us grew up with the, the old Babe Ruth thing. How many, does anyone have a Babe Ruth signed baseball? No. Those are pretty expensive. But I thought maybe that would be one of the most expensive things would probably be some kind of sports memorabilia, but I was wrong. The most expensive autograph sold in 2012 for $9.8 million. $9.8 million for an autograph. 2012. Guess whose it was? George Washington. George Washington's signature on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the original one. So that's what sold for $9.8 million dollars so very expensive autograph and here we have god's autograph in the word of god he has given to us his word and and you know for us to study for us to learn for us to be comforted by and paul says the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all so um you know it's it came to them orally he he started this church Paul taught them uh, verbally. He taught them orally. Uh, he wrote them these two letters, and Paul says this letter is the real deal because it has my autograph on it, and there were plenty of people trying to uh, counterfeit the truth back of them as there is today. But Paul's own hand, Paul's own hand writing was upon this. So, you know, in verse 18, we see Paul said, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So Paul is gentle still. He, he started out in the first uh, letter there in chapter 2. He said, I was as gentle as a nurse is with her children. And he's still gentle with them after all this time as he gives to them the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the best gift we can give, isn't it? The grace of the Lord. Nothing that we can earn. But it's been given to us by Christ. And, you know, His grace can come to us every day. Every day, God's mercies are renewed. God is never going to run out of grace. Uh, Romans says, God has more grace than you have sin. And I have sin. 
You know, so that's why Peter could be reconciled after he betrayed the Lord and that public disgrace. So here, this grace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins. He is the one that supplies this grace for us. And Paul, without exception, he says, be with you all. Even the, the fellow over there in verse 10, who was too lazy to work, you know, and God's love comes to us without measure. And God's grace comes to us without measure. And Paul ends this book up by giving them a big old dose of the grace from the Lord to every single person. Amen. And we close out this book. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy to us. And Father, even help us with the sin in ourselves and, and help us with the sin around us and to have the right attitude about it. These, uh, these things are serious, Father. The church is a serious place. Sin is serious. You're serious. And Father, we just pray that you would help us with these things. Help us to love one another and help us as Galatians 1 says, to consider ourselves lest we should fall. So we want to help anyone and everybody that we can. And we know your son was a friend of sinners. And all the sinners can come to him. We can come to him and not be ridiculed and not be uh, rejected, but to have the new birth, to be born again, and to have the Spirit in us to help us understand and know what the truth is. We thank you for this precious gospel and these precious letters and this great grace gift you've given to us or your son. And we pray in his name. Amen. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting Darkened world as we go from.